Welcome to the Biotech Startups Podcast by Exceda. Join us as we speak with first-time founders, serial entrepreneurs, and experienced investors about the challenges and triumphs of running a biotech startup, from pre-seed to IPO, with your host, John Chi. In our last episode, we spoke with Martin Brenner about his childhood in Germany, his transition from electrical engineering to veterinary medicine, discovering his passion for pharmacology and his experience at Eli Lilly. If you missed it, be sure to go back and give part one a listen. We continue our conversation in part two, talking about Martin's time at Pfizer, his move to AstraZeneca, his vision of building a biotech within a large pharmaceutical company, and the importance of balance between structure and agility. It sounds like this was decently well into your time at Lilly. From there, did you have a thought of, I could stay at Lilly forever? Or were you starting to think of, I I need to figure out where my next kind of opportunity and, you know, company would be? I, at this point, I really kind of thought, you know, Lilly is is the spot for me, right? And uh, of course, you know, um, when I came back from that training, adjusted uh, my my uh, behaviors in, in some areas, learned a lot of things, how to do things differently. Um, I was back on, on my trajectory, but um, obviously Lilly, like many companies, got a little bit into financial trouble at the time, and they had to consolidate their R&D sites, right? So uh, the first actually place I could really, you know, employ uh, and use my newly learned skills was in the site closure, right? Th- these are bad times, right? And and it's th- there's three days in my life um, that I I do not want to relive, but at the same time I also know you have to do this. And if you if you don't hurt letting people go, uh, large amounts of people, if if that doesn't hurt you anymore, it's time to get out. If 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 you if you're not anymore a human being that can relate to the pain that is inflicted, um, it's time to leave. <laughs> and so so that time in, in in Hamburg when we closed the site, that was one of them. I knew relatively early on that Lily wanted to retain me. The question was uh, talking with my wife through, should we relocate to the US? And uh, that was that was not a, a you know slam dunk, uh, at least in the beginning. Um, but kind of being there, making sure that all of my team members, I made sure all of them had a job before I left. So that site closure went on for a year. It was it was very painful. Um, and I actually extended my stay in Germany until everybody had a job of my team. And so once that was done, I was I was ready. Uh, and so uh, relocated then to the US. That reset the clock at Lilly. So I thought, wow, now it's a completely the corporate center, right? In, in Indianapolis, this is where the power is wielded. Uh, now, now I'm getting to to know the real big things, right? And and see how Lilly actually works internally. And so that reset the clock for me a little bit. But at the same time, as I said, Lilly was really kind of compressing down a little bit. And uh, I I was in a in a meeting where you know we had people that had been at Lilly for forty years that were told that they're laid laid off or had had to be laid off. They were crying in their cars in the in the parking lot, right? And so this was a first for Lily. This was extremely painful for the entire company. That was not Lily. Lily was always we take care of our people, and for the first time, kind of the environment drove Lily to do things that were not really kind of in line in what the company did before, right? I think that was the first time in Lily's entire career that because they're not growing, they had to actually lay off people, and so it was it was a tough time, and. So obviously my development opportunities shrank as well, because again, if you're narrowing down your therapeutic areas, if you're narrowing down, you know, the, the teams that you're building, uh, I had a reset because I started, I built Lily a lab for um, pancreatic, eyelid, pancreatic eyelid research and for uh, in vivo pharmacology specifically to look at insulin sensitivity. That's what, that was my, my job. So I went back from 20 people to two, back in the science, rolled up my sleeves, got back into doing actual experiments in the morning. As <laughs> My boss came in one morning and I, I basically dropped a, a vial because I didn't hear him. And he said behind me, you're actually working in the lab? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm actually working in the lab. And so, you know, this, this is actually how I started and this is, you know, what I can do. Um, so it was really kind of a reset and I focused a lot more on broadening my scientific skills at that time. So it was it was a good time. It was different. It was a good time. But at one point, you just hit a ceiling where, where you know, yeah, there's so many talented people and they have been longer with the company and they needed to be promoted. Again, typical 
it is unfortunately what large companies do, right? Um, this is a lot better these days, but at the time it was very, very hierarchical at that. And so that was when I realized I can wait now for two or three years until an opportunity pops up, or I'll just, you know, take everything I learned, go to some company that can utilize it and also provides me with stuff that I don't know. For me, it was always important. Don't take a job. You already can do hundred percent. That's boring. Take one that is, you can do 80%. And that's how you learn, right? This, you make mistakes. Um, with these new things that you need to learn absolutely every single i make mistakes every single time i take a new job but you also learn with those right and so it was important to me pfizer at the time in groton they just went through this massive layoff uh and i needed to rebuild and it was a very very hard thing to do for them because again pfizer metabolic disease was not exactly known at the time to be stellar uh in the field to kind of rebuild that credibility with really good science that was a that was a, a, a hard act but it was suddenly like you're playing with the big boys. Pfizer was much bigger. They did massive, massive strategic decisions, which then reverberated through the entire company, right? It was also not a family organization that had one location. It was kind of a an amalgamation of multiple companies that had been brought together. So it was a very different environment. Very important for me to see coming from Lilly to a completely different company culture, right? They do literally the same, same targets, same disease areas, but ultimately very, very different companies. And yeah, it was, you know, we could influence a lot to the better, I believe. Uh, but at the same time, we also learned a lot. And, and a lot of the things I learned is things that I don't want to do. <laughs> so that was, that's also important, right? You see how, how things got handled and you think, Meh, that yeah. is not exactly how I would treat people. Yeah. Uh, and so this is, this is also really important, not just to learn from good experiences, but also to say, wait a second, this could be done better. Right. And, and so in, in that case, obviously with Pfizer be becoming me, becoming a lot more into a strategic role, uh, a lot more into, again, my team was, growing rapidly from a few people to uh, back to 11 or 12 people. So it, it, I got back into this more kind of leadership role, but now laced with kind of all of the strategy. What are we going to do in the future, right? How do we deploy our resources to kind of make a drug? Because, uh, and Groton, Groton did not have a really good track record of, of generating medicines. And that ultimately, you know, led Pfizer to kind of say, okay, let's Let's move up to, to Massachusetts. But yeah, it was heartbreaking for me to leave Lily behind because it, it was like a family, but it needed to be done because my career really, I would have put my career on hold for two to three years. So it was it was the only choice to kind of keep growing fast. Totally. And I, I feel the exact same way about like, you know, these hard learned, painful experiences um, being the most important ones. I would never want to relive it. Like I, you know, it, like, it is like, I, I'm glad those experiences are in the rear view mirror, but it is like those lessons that you take with you. That it, I think it is in, inextricably tied to the pain aspect where it's like seared into you, like where you, you, that is a lesson that you are going to take with you to the grave because of how painful it was. But again, not trying to relive it. So I, I, it really, really resonates with me. And I think you're exactly right about, you know, if, if you don't feel that pain anymore, you need a change of environment. Um, that is important because if you're if you're starting to get desensitized, it's um, yeah, bad. That's a, that's a red flag for sure. Um, um, and you know, at Pfizer, can you like you're describing? It's very interesting to me, kind of like you know, same target but vastly different approach to it. Can you describe that like the differences between Lilly and Pfizer and their approaches? So Pfizer was a, a lot more directed, right? Pfizer wanted something, Pfizer went after it, right? So a lot more, you know, um, power behind every move they made. It was strategically well thought out, right? And sometimes, again, also to be brutal honest, brutally honest, if a strategy didn't work out, you get rid of it, right? You don't do it, right? It, again, like an entrepreneur, right? You you do something, you see it's not working, you don't you don't throw good money after after bad, right? Uh, and so you needed to make this change really rapidly. And, and this was what drove Pfizer. You realized, whoa, this is operating on a much, much bigger level. I was there when uh, Wyeth got acquired. Um, Pfizer grew at the time to 140,000 people. I mean, this was, in, I couldn't even imagine the, the amount of people. And then basically three years later, Pfizer was back to 90,000, right? So again, the so-called synergies, right? <laughs> I'm not a big fan of this, right? I'm a huge fan of doing deals where two winners walk away, right? That's in my eyes, the best deals you can strike. 
Um, and so I had a lot of people that I got to know from wife, really talented and smart people that would just not fit into the Pfizer mold, right? One of them being, you know, the CSO for diabetes at Lilly now, uh, who just, you know, Pfizer didn't appreciate, right? And so again, there's there's these differences. And again, very important, right? If you don't fit, there's a reason why I have never worked for for Roche, for example, right? There's there's just certain companies don't fit your 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 personality and how you do things. And you know this up front. Novartis is another one, right? So these are very, very successful and great companies with fantastically talented people. But I know personally, after you know doing a few interviews with those companies, not not, not my shtick, right? I, I I wouldn't be happy and they wouldn't be happy with me, right? So and you you need to learn this as well and you know accept this because again it doesn't make you a bad scientist doesn't make you a bad leader if one company doesn't think you're you're a fit right you find the company that you fit and that you can actually help uh, to do something meaningful with your skill set absolutely and I think when I when I when I talk to colleagues and friends about like the whether it be the interview process or just like tr an or trying to figure out if you want to join an organization. It's kind of like a date, like, and it, it really is like dating and there's got to be a, like a mutual fit. And when one person is like forcing it and it, others like not really bought in, it's just like way better to just be like, okay, maybe we look elsewhere um, versus like, you know, a marriage where it's like, oh God, this, I, I try to turn a blind eye to this like cultural mismatch and I'm now paying for it. It's always like as painful as, you know, you know, if you're interviewing for a job and maybe you don't get the job, but maybe that was a bullet that you have dodged. Like it, it is not a knock on you. It, it might have just been a bad fit and you would you might have been unhappy if, if it went otherwise, um, which is an important thing to think about. Abs, abs, it's exactly like this, right? Yeah, don't force it, right? Find find the right connection, right? Find the right company where you're where you are being appreciated and you appreciate what the company is doing for you. That's really, really important. And again, no knock against any company or any scientist who who does or does not get that job, right? And and a lot of my mentees when they start their career say, well, I've tried so many times, I said, well, that's the game, right? You need your first job. Once you have your first job under the belt, you, we're talking a different game, but get that first job, get it done, get it out of the way. Don't give up, right? You're going to hear a lot of no's. And then at one point, there's going to be a yes. I haven't had any person that I mentored that didn't ultimately get a job, right? Some, it took longer. Others, it, it was faster. But at one point, you get that first job. And from that point on, it's it's all up to you. Because again, the way you treat your job, the way you soak in information and try to learn on the job, this is all up to you, right? From that point, it's it's you. And uh, it's it's not the chance anymore. <laughs> Yeah, and 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 is I I I think my friend uh, had a funny uh, example, kind of like the the orchestra and the conductor is like you have to kiss a lot of frogs before you before you meet your prince, um, and and it's okay, it's it's okay, and everyone goes through it, um, and you know, and just knowing that like this no like knowing what you want and you don't want and figuring out that cultural fit, but when you find that cultural fit, you're, you're off to the races and you move so much quicker. Um, so and 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 you know. At Pfizer, you know, you you've been kind of tasked with rebuilding. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Yeah, so so there's two ways of doing this. And and one way I can talk later about Merck, where you start from scratch, blank canvas, right? This is the much, much easier path because you can literally design the house from from the ground up, right? A much, much more complicated uh, path is if you're having an environment already established, if you have the people established and you really can't move in one or another direction, then it really comes down to can you actually engage, re-engage people? Because one of the things you see a lot in, in larger companies is that people get completely disengaged. There's this misconception, misperception to basically say big companies are much more stable than biotechs. Not my experience. I had more changes at Pfizer than I had in any biotech company I ever was, right? Because things change rapidly, right? Strategies change, you know, sites close and you move your team. And so again, people easily, you can easily disengage your team, right? And so what I walked into at Groton was a team that just went through a really bad phase of layoff. Lots of good friends and colleagues over the years gone, right? And how do you re-engage them? There's this new guy coming in. What does he know, <laughs> right? How do you engage people, right? And and again, this this straight out of the, the playbook of a biotech, right? 
all value is created by people and you need to reinstill this, right? You need to make sure people understand you're important. You're important to me. You're important to this organization. With everything you do, data is what is important, right? If you generate that data, you're important. And so basically drilling back down saying, you guys know everything. It's, it's like a, a soccer player who's really, really good, but just has a bad season, right? You, you have to get them out of the rut and have to get them into, you know, starting to believe in themselves again. And, and this is something that, you know, I, I spend a lot of time at Pfizer, so just kind of making people believe in themselves again. Of course, you know, it shoots you in, in your behind if, you know, 10 months later, company says, hey, by the way, we're moving to Boston and you can't bring more than two or three people over your team. <laughs> that, that's That's kind of, that's that's the hard part then right you you still have to deal with this and you still have to you know stay human in in all of this and and treat your colleagues and and everybody with respect but it's this makes it a lot harder right so but i mean i was able to kind of get people back on board uh most most of them apart from i believe one that you know it, it just wouldn't work out some people are just at one point burned out right and so uh, but we got back to this and we got actually a, a fun group of scientists together and uh, it, it worked for, you know, a, a good amount of time. Um, but then this move to Massachusetts to Boston was was announced. And so first, everybody was a little, uh, you know, do we like this? Do we not? And, you know, Pfizer was nice. They offered a relocation package. Honestly, Boston is not one of my favorite towns, uh, to be to be frank. Um, it, it's just not. I like to be outdoors. I, I do a lot of hiking and cycling and, and, and lots of outdoor activities. B Boston is not exactly a town where yeah. uh, I feel I can do all of these things. <laughs> but um, so we looked at this and I commuted for a year uh, from uh, Connecticut, Northern Connecticut uh, to Boston uh, by car, which was also a pain in the, in the neck. But what was really good is we built Pfizer a really top-notch science team uh, probably first time in a long time so we got all these kids from the golden years of for example UCSD Jerry Olevsky's lab Saswada Talukdar who's who's today a big big shot at, at Merck um, a really talented scientist probably the, the smartest person on the planet that I know we recruited Saswada to uh, to Pfizer we had a lot of local people coming from MIT Harvard and it was just suddenly a fun group, really smart. We did a lot of really great science. And um, unfortunately, you know, what, what happened is that, you know, the hierarchy set in. And so middle management was replaced with people who were not necessarily kind of the most brilliant scientists. And uh, that drove a lot of people at one point. I said, OK, I, 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 can't, I just can't do that anymore. Right. And, and I need somebody I can I can look up to and I can learn something from, not somebody I need to educate on what. RNA and DNA is basically right. So and and it 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 literally got to this point. And at this point, it was clear we had built something that was very very special. Um, we had built a, a science team that was exceptional uh, for the time. But at one point, it's just you 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 built these hierarchies in where you literally kind of suppress ideas, suppress kind of growth. And at that point, I knew it was just time to 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 move on. And this is when AstraZeneca came calling. Uh, and that was actually my first really, really big job uh, that I took with AstraZeneca. 150 people were reporting to me when I started. Uh, three big siloed organizations that I had to, you know, painfully take apart and rebuild. Uh, a lot of fun doing this, and a lot of great people that I met there. But uh, yeah, that was that was basically Pfizer um, for me. It was just at one point it 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 just didn't move forward anymore, and specifically in the cardiovascular space, there was a little bit of a misalignment between the R&D group and also the the clinical group or kind of the commercial group because we came with really cool ideas of, of new targets. And the the clinical group, in a, in a foreshadowing of what happened to diabetes research after the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, basically said, yeah, you need to prove to us that you're having cardiovascular benefits. And we said, well, that's why you do outcome studies. So how can I prove this before, yeah, before I yeah, do an outcome yeah. study? <laughs> so there was there was a misalignment and it, it just made your life really horrible because we had great programs. We wanted to move them in the clinic and we we were sure that would help people. But again, there was just this this misalignment and it, it cannot work that way, right? This is this is why smaller organizations with a tighter um uh, communication structure and strategic structure are, are way more efficient in, in getting this out. That's really fascinating. And I, I think from the outside looking in for anyone who hasn't been at Big Pharma would imagine it's just like 
this perfectly well-oiled machine. It just can do no wrong, just headline after headline of success after success. But it is incredibly like eye-opening to hear about the kind of these inner workings where, and again, it's just like exactly what you said, where at the end of the day, it's the people like, and making the wrong, like organizational change and having like a killer, all like the Avengers team that you've assembled, not want to be there anymore is, it is just like, be so careful. Just be so, so careful. Like it, it can be easy when you're, you know, you're just like thinking about it from like a, an Excel spreadsheet, but it's like, you gotta, you can't forget that at, like, it is like, it is, you know, science is what not only a creative endeavor, but it's like, you have, you got to make sure everyone is in there. You know, they're like all stars. Like you got to make sure they're in an environment where they can continue to do their thing. Um, so, and, it, you know, and, and Pfizer, you, you just, you just imagine they have that part figured out, but if Pfizer is still <laughs> like, still kind of like having these, like, you know, the kind of like these stumbles, it's like, you know, you, you can imagine that is happening everywhere. Um, in, in, in any organization of any size. Um, and so after your time at Pfizer, like you mentioned, you, you were now heading towards AstraZeneca. Can you talk, talk a little, and the team seems much larger this time. Can you talk a little bit about the, you know, the opportunity you saw at AstraZeneca, you know, how it presented itself and what you ended up doing there? So uh, it was very funny because a, a European headhunter reached out to me because, you know, obviously I was born and raised in, in Germany and uh, AstraZeneca had that job offering in uh, Gothenburg in Sweden. And at that time, we already lived here in the US, my wife and I, for, you know, five years. And you get used to having friends from all over the world, right? I have friends from Kenya, from everywhere in Asia, Japan, China, Taiwan, Korea and uh, uh, from South America. So you're getting used to kind of that diversity, right? And so AstraZeneca pulled me saying, hey, there's 21 nations working here at, at our center in Gothenburg. And I thought, oh, so maybe this is kind of a little island of diversity. So this is great for me. And of course, when I came there, it was Germans, Dutch, uh, Danish, Central Europeans, right? It, it, I, I don't mean any disrespect to any nation in Central Europe, but we're all the same. This is not what I thought, but okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had, I think, one colleague from India and one from China in the 150 people team. Oh, maybe, okay. maybe two from China. Yeah, okay. yeah, so it, yeah, was, yeah. it was really kind of not what I expected. And outside of work was was much, much harder. Um, but, you know, it was a, it was a great time. So, um my boss at the time, who also started basically with me, Marcus Schindler, he came from a biotech in the UK. So he's he was German as well, but spent a lot of time in in uh, in a foreign country living and working. And I can tell usually people apart within three seconds in the conversation if they actually have lived outside of their country, because it changes how you see things, right? Because you have to adapt to a different culture. And you don't do this on vacation. You do this when you actually work in a country. And so um, he was really experienced and he was a biotech guy, right? They brought him in because they wanted to kind of refresh all of this. And uh, Marcus pulled us out, the, his entire leadership team, the first week we all started and said, let's huddle up in a room. Let's decide what we want to deliver, what we want to build. And then let's decide how we're going to do this. And last but not least, how do we communicate it? This is the first time somebody came actually with a strategy to kind of overhaul an organization, a real thought through strategy. I learned a lot from this guy. It was really amazing, right? And so we literally sat down and redesigned the entire organization, right? So I had these three silos, 50 people each. One was a diabetes group with diabetes obesity. One was cardiovascular. And then there was a screening group in the middle. And again, there was a lot of hierarchy at AstraZeneca at the time. So the old dudes were controlling everything, right? And they were suppressing really good people. And I had one woman, uh, Karina Emela, who was literally a first author on, a, I believe, a nature paper. Not nature. Uh, what was it? Um, I, I might have been cell. One of the science. She, she was a, a first author on the science paper, right? And she was literally kind of not thriving in that environment, right? She was suppressed by layers and layers. And so the first thing we did after we started to rebuild this, I took these three silos apart and built teams of about 10. And each team had was semi-autonomous, so they could do their own portfolio work, they could do all their own work, um, they, they could perform most of the tasks for their projects, but not all of them. They needed to reach out to partner groups. 
So that's how I connected them back in. Um, I First of all, I moved my office away from the tower where all of the management sat next to the lab. And we had a cowbell outside. And whenever somebody had a great experiment and great data, they could ring the cowbell. And because it was Sweden, um, we had a glass of champagne. <laughs> and so it was it was culturally very different, right? Um, and I, I truly enjoyed my job. I truly enjoyed the people um, that I was working with. One morning, I, I actually walked into my office. And um, since we're just among you and me, <laughs> uh, there was a whole you know, I don't know how many boxes and, and, and crates of alcohol under my desk. And I said, uh, guys, what's happening here? And they said, oh, inspection. So they're looking at the freezer. That's why we, you know, momentarily put the booze under your desk. We're going to move it out later. Oh, my God. That's so, <laughs> so funny. That that was kind of classical, right? So it's a different culture. It's it's And it was so important and, and also kind of nice to kind of be part of that, right? It was very, very different. But you know, although all of that was working really well, and and one of the key moments in my life was actually that connection with Moderna. When Moderna was eight people strong, right? Uh, Stefan was just has had just arrived. Um, he wasn't a billionaire at the time, and um, so it was so fascinating to me because Moderna could do experiments in three days, and it took us three weeks, and they could do something in a week that took us a few months. And I was always fascinated. How can I get my team to perform that fast? And again, with a large organization comes process. Process is good if certain things happen over and over and over again. Process is really, really bad if you need to invent things, right? So again, there's the separation. Big pharmaceutical companies are really, really good as an engine. They're really not good at being nimble and fast. The benefit of a biotech is we're fast. We're really, really fast. So that kind of ultimately ignited that that biotech uh, spark in me and that what what drove me basically to kind of biotech ultimately to work with moderna on this and see how how absolutely fascinatingly fast and efficient they were doing research and of course you know it there was a, a very personal component for me leaving sweden and uh, at work i had 13 hour days and we had one great summer uh, where the sun was shining for six weeks and it never got dark in, in at night. It was fantastic. The landscape was beautiful. We were out with our dogs hiking all night. and um, But outside of work, we just didn't connect really well with people. It was very, very strange. Uh, so we, for whatever reason, might have been us. We we don't have children. We just have dogs. And, and it, it was just very hard for us to integrate in, in society outside of work. And of course, you know, I being at work for a long time, I it didn't hit me as hard, but my wife basically was there all day long, right? Alone. And so at one point it came literally down to us. We, we were depressed outside of work, really depressed. And we said, okay, either we white knuckle this through or we're going to pull the plug and, and move back to the US. And, and that's what we ultimately decided. It was a very personal decision. It had nothing to do with AstraZeneca. I loved my job. I loved my team. It was just this very, very personal living in Sweden and in being not kind of among friends from all over the place, which you get used to so, so fast. And you don't want to miss that anymore. I have the same feeling when I go back to Germany. Um, it sometimes feels like people are still talking about the things they talked 20 years ago. <laughs> and so it's just not moving forward. And and so that was the feeling we had. And and it was just really hard for us to kind of accept this for the for the foreseeable future at least. So that's why we started looking, you know, to come back to the US. And and it's important, like, you know, I think you were talking about like, do we just white knuckle, like bite the bullet here and just like stick this out? But like the mental health, the mental toll, like eventually something would break. Like there's only so long you can do it until some, and then, and then you wouldn't be able to bring your best self. Like I would imagine it would start to spill over into, and then, and then after that, AstraZeneca would, you know, it would not be a good time anymore because like every, like whatever was going on in the personal side, just like starts to bleed over. So, you know, I, w when I speak to my wife about this, it's like, it's the same thing. It's like, you got like, you have one self. You wake up, you you go into the lab, and you also go home. That's the same person. And you can't have it be this thing where it's like, oh, I'm like depressed when I get home. Like it needs to be this thing where you you feel generally good about, you know, all of it so you can bring your best self. So I, I it completely resonates with me. Um, and so you've you made the decision. We're going back to the US. How did the opportunity at Merck, you know, come about? So one day I, I get a call from Mark Arion and Mark was the CEO at uh, um, 
uh, one of the San Diego biotechs, one of the first generation San Diego biotechs. And uh, Mark had uh, probably also suffered through a little time at Merck being the site head in, I believe, Kenilworth. And he's a scientist by heart. He's a very, very good strategist. And Mark had this vision. He said, I want to build a biotech within the walls of a large pharmaceutical company. I want the speed and the innovation coupled with all of the, you know, the ar artillery coming in, right? You know, <laughs> the cavalry coming in. And so I thought, wow, this sounds like, you know, I just had seen how Moderna operates. That sounded like something, wow, I want to do that, right? Of course, you know, you can flip that coin and say, well, instead of getting best of both worlds, you could actually get the worst of both worlds too. <laughs> so there's there's a non non zero percent outcome that could be like that, right? Um, and it was a it was a little bit of a mixed bag. But um, when when I started talking to Mark, I said, look, this I love this idea, right? Let let me be as fast as I can. Let me assemble a team of really kind of top notch people. Um, give me some money. Give me some lab space. Uh, we'll carve out a, a disease area. Let me be flexible. Let me go a little into rare diseases as well. Let me not just focus on cardiometabolic and NASH and, and what have you. And so he was all up for that, right? And uh, so um, I started first in New Jersey um, because we, we were not sure where we wanted to build that team. Ultimately, and ended up being in Boston. Uh, again, I, I owe my wife so much because again, we, in Connecticut, we had just built a house, moved in. And a month later, we basically knew we would be moving to Boston, uh, and our house in New Jersey, we had just moved in. And literally the day we moved in, <laughs> I told her, um, would you, would you mind moving to Boston? Your so, wife is a saint. <laughs> it's a she's, saint. She's a saint. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and yeah. I, I will never make enough money to pay her back. <laughs> But, you know, this was this was exciting. Right. And and so after, you know, just kind of training people up in, in New Jersey so that they could run kind of the late stage group. Right. I started, then, you know, building building the team up in Boston. And, you know, because I had built a reputation in the industry, you know, if you are joining me, I have your best interest in mind. Right. If you're joining me, I will give you every growth opportunity. So Swala Talukta, who I hired to Pfizer, I think in his second year, he was running a clinical program at Pfizer. Right. This is all kudos because he's a really smart guy, but also, you know, you need to have that opportunity, which I gave him. And so I think this reputation kind of helped me a lot, kind of finding the right people. I'm always interested in people that are scientist entrepreneurs. I want them to feel like in a few years, I'll start my own job. If I get them to do that, I know I've done my job, right? If they stick around for too long, Right, it's probably not in their best interest. I want them to really grow, grow, grow. And if I'm if I taught them everything I know, time to move on. Right, get to your next job. And so I got a really stellar group of people in. Um, you know, at at Merck, we I had a couple of Saswara to look that joined me again from from Pfizer. Um, um, Ing Zhang Zhou uh, from Pfizer again, a very very overlooked scientist, a brilliant mind just very quiet and you know all it takes sometimes is a little encouragement and those brilliant minds just start to explode and, and deliver really you know fantastic stuff uh a few other people um that uh that joined us it was a really really strong group and we scared the hell out of most groups at Merck and that was ultimately really a problem right because we ran a portfolio of five programs we had co collaborations with three four um, biotechs in Boston. We I had collaborations at the same time with uh, the University of Kobe, the University of Tokyo, and then I had a triple collaboration with UT Southwestern, um, Columbia, and UCSD that delivered literally five targets within in a year and a half. So we were running like crazy, and it worked as long as we kept it within our scope. 15 people we could execute. The second we interfaced with the rest of Merck, because our speed was so frightening, I felt like everybody was trying to slow us down, right? Everybody was kind of afraid, is this the new norm? Can we live up to that? And ultimately, you know, that model actually took off at Merck, right? Merck started building all these little satellites in, in, uh, in, uh, in Boston. Uh, literally exactly the same design I, I put up, right? And so it was it was very successful, but at the same time, self-limiting uh, because at one point, again, you run into politics 
And Merck at the time, it was charged with politics, right? Roger Palmuto had just come back. There was a strong focus on Keytruda and immune oncology. And we broke our backs to move a program into IND enabling that would have been really useful for um, heart failure. And we had a really smart idea. We wanted to use a population in South America that had Chagas disease. So it's heart failure coming from one etiology only from a parasite. Always the same basically history. If we could have done a trial there for cheap, uh, with a very defined population, we could have easily expanded that into a population with general heart failure in the US, in Europe. But we heard basically, hey, before I do that trial, I'm going to rather do one more trial with Keytruda. And that was for me that I did a mic drop at this point, right? You don't get a group of 15 people dedicating basically their life to generating medicines and then tell them halfway through, nice try, <laughs> but we're not going to do that. And there was, there was, for me, that was it. And don't get me wrong, Pfizer, uh, Merck is extremely successful, no question at all. And strategically, it was the right move, absolutely correct, right? But for us as scientists, it was just really gut wrenching, right? And so, since I had just built more or less a biotech within the walls of a larger company, I thought, okay, let's let's just go out in the wild and do it, do it in in, in the real world, do it with a real biotech. And this this is how I how I got out of big pharma. I I just got very, very tired of, you know, strategies and uh, strategic decisions that I either couldn't influence or, you know, I just became a passenger and I just wanted to kind of be uh, able to kind of make these decisions by myself. That's really fascinating. It, it, it's really fascinating to me that th the first reaction is like, we don't like, we don't like all this, this winning that's happening. <laughs> like, we don't like all this winning that's taking place right now in your teams, Martin. Maybe we should not do that. Like it, you would imagine it would be a flip, kind of a more a receptive, like, oh, perhaps this could be a new way to do things that could. And obviously now exactly you said they're like starting to do it. But it, you, you'd imagine that like when you see a kind of a winning formula start to emerge, you want to kind of like start, let's double down on this and like and see where this goes. And sooner than later versus just like, oh, let's like ruminate on this and and you know figure out you know over a long span of time and and by the time you ruminate on it everyone doesn't everyone's like i'm 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 out um and that's a really interesting like kind of like what i'm seeing is like kind of this like organizational kind of like the the responsibility kind of being pushed down and kind of these smaller nimble teams that let you kind of like iterate quicker and not get bogged down with all the red tape um would you it would you say that's kind of how you kind of you kind of think about an engineer a, a kind of like company uh, like an org like an org hierarchy or just org structure yeah all, all exactly like this right you you want to have the smallest functional group together that can actually execute certain certain things without actually slowing them down with process right and again I, you know, don't want to, you know, bore you with kind of the the resource meetings I had to sit through at Merck, right? Again, for a large organization, that's that you need to organize that. And there's people who thrive in this environment, right? This is, I, I know a lot of people who are go to bed very proudly to say, I got the 10 million that I wanted and another VP didn't get the 10 million. So, and they're, they're happy with this. It, to me, it felt like you're standing in my way of helping people. And if you stand in my way, I have two choices. Either I can try to kind of get you out of my way or I'll be out, right? And and ultimately, you know, you, organizations can change from the bottom up. We could, we could show this at Pfizer. We could just, at Pfizer sometimes, you know, after the move to Boston, you know, a lot of people were really kind of still upset with the move up to, to Boston. And we built this small circle where we met in the morning, had a coffee and had a laugh. And it grew from my team to other people stopping by and wanting to have a laugh too. So you can change kind of the environment. You can change kind of the culture of an organization from the bottom up. But it is extremely laborious. It takes a lot of time. And again, you can be, if you don't get that support from the top, you're at one point, you're just going to fail, right? You can build a microcosm, that's fine. But beyond that microcosm, you just don't have that influence. And this is what kind of, you know, is the difference between, you know, people who really enjoy that process, right? Who enjoy doing this, you know, we know exactly how this is this is going to play out. That's great for people who who are, you know, wired that way. It's a great environment, right? And I think this is the, the strength of a pharmaceutical company, right? You execute these things, not with just one program in the clinic, you execute a hundred per year in the clinic or more. That's where it's great. But leave kind of the innovation part to the teams that actually are 
built for that, right? And you cannot combine this. I actually made the suggestion at Merck to say, look, you're spending X amount of dollars in my team per year. Why don't you just give me that money? We go look for our own facility. We start our own biotech and you have first rights of refusal. Very simple, right? And for the love of God, Merck would not let go <laughs> because if you lose control, you're never going to gain it back, right? So on the one hand, there's this need to innovate. On the other hand, there's also this fear or used to be, I, you know, I've been out of pharma for a while now, but this fear of letting go, of letting go something that you can't bring back. But again, it comes down to what are you good at, right? And what, what, where do you excel? And that's where you focus on, right? And if you do not excel at innovation or internal, you know, uh, innovation, you outsource this, right? You could take all of the early R&D budget, put it in five, six, seven biotech companies, you probably would have a much, much better outcome. But again, then you lose your your engine, right? Even if that engine stutters and sometimes and doesn't produce in, in, other, in other moments, there's this fear, this angst to kind of lose the engine, right? And so it's it's I think it's been a, a struggle for for every large company, not necessarily only for biotech, for for tech industry as well. How do you retain that you know innovation piece? How do you let people really run free and let them do what they do best without actually locking them down, but still kind of keep the direction that you need to go, right? I think, and this is to me an unsolved problem. It requires a lot of, it's an art form to kind of do that, but it is dependent on the team, on your members, on the environment, on, it is a mu very, very multifaceted process, uh, problem. Yeah, totally. It feels like threading the needle, really. It kind of like these like opposing forces that are just kind of like, kind of like fighting on each other. It just like doesn't like meld well. And your, your description of like, this is laborious. It's like, I think someone described like these larger organizations as like trying to like move an aircraft carrier. It's going to take its time. It's good. It's, it, there's a lot of mass to move here and it will take a lot of time, blood, sweat and tears. That's all for this episode of the Biotech Startups podcast. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Martin Brenner. Tune in to part three of our conversation to learn more about his journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave us a review and share it with your friends. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to having you join us again on the Biotech Startups podcast for part three of Martin's story. The Biotech Startups podcast is produced by Exceda. Don't want to miss an episode? Search for the Biotech Startups podcast wherever you get your podcasts and click subscribe. Exceda provides research labs with equipment leases on founder-friendly terms to support paths to exceptional outcomes. To learn more, visit our website, www.exedr.com. On behalf of the team here at Exceda, thanks for listening. The Biotech Startups podcast provides general insights into the life science sector through the experiences of its guests. The use of information on this podcast or materials linked from the podcast is at the user's own risk. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not the views of Exceda or sponsors. No reference to any product, service or company in the podcast is an endorsement by Exceda or its guests.